Hey, Rich. Hey, Valentin. How's it going? Great. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, who's going to go first? Learning about uh, .NET and chiseled Ubuntu containers. Uh, I think Valentin's going to go first. Um, he's calling from France, I think. Um, Are you? Oh, wow. Yeah. I am. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we're, we're in a remote part of France, so hopefully it doesn't break. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I was one of the things. So, Rich, you might be on in case something happened to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope, I hope not. Yeah, All right, yeah. I'm yeah. going to add your uh, to the stream here. I'm going to mute my camera and take it away. All right, let's get started then. Um, so we're going to discuss the net on Linux and Docker containers, as uh, Scott mentioned, and uh, hopefully tell you a great story of the collaboration be between Canonical and Microsoft and how we improved our uh, software supply chain between the two, the two vendors and uh, how we innovated to um, bring these optimized Ubuntu-based container images for the .NET platform. So for the next uh, 25, 30 minutes, uh, your hosts are going to be Rich Lander, who you might already know, uh, program manager for the .NET team, and uh, myself, Valentin Vieno, program uh, product manager at Canonical for uh, the Ubuntu container images and uh, more broadly all the containers that we are we are building. Um, so how all of this started a few months back, um, it was as a first as a collaboration to set up a direct supply chain and kind of communication line between our teams to make sure that .NET on Ubuntu had a very strong vendor's story, uh, making sure that .NET developers could all trust this content and get the, the easiest access to .NET on, on Ubuntu. Uh, and then we kind of started innovating around these containers and uh, discussing what were great goals to have and great practices to have on containers and how we are going to build this uh, for .NET. And uh, we sort of came up with a list of principles that you have on screen now uh, that has been guiding our work there. Um, the first one being that we think containers images should be as small as possible. I think there's nothing too controversial here. Uh, basically saying that we should ship just the minimum content that is required to run our containerized processes, uh, making sure that we are not introducing any liability or any useless content in what we are shipping there. Um, we also came up with this uh, kind of thought that your preferred development environment uh, may be Ubuntu, but even if it's not Ubuntu, should be the same as your well, not the same, but aligned with your production. Uh, it's kind of the same as staging and production should be the same, but here it's uh, kind of development should be aligned so that you don't have compatibility issues or tooling that doesn't work together. It actually comes from uh, when well, we had users and customers that were uh, using Ubuntu in, in development and then Alpine in production and coming to us with issues of compatibility or tooling that wasn't working anymore. Um, so it makes sense that you're trying to align this even if development is actually kind of a full-blown version of your production. Uh, the third statement is kind of the reverse of that, is saying your production should be kind of a chiseled slice of your uh, development. It's a bit of a spoiler of what's coming next. Uh, what we mean with chiseled slice is just like to take your development environment, isolate what's needed for your microservices to run, and that's your production environment that makes life just easier. Um, we also discussed that, well, both of our customers really wanted to the two of our companies, but really all the platforms to work together. Um, well, they have to deal with a lot of vendors and a lot of platforms for what, what, what you are doing, um, whether it's from the hardware to the workloads. And it makes sense that uh, you'd want us to be working together to make sure it's a seamless experience. And so that's what we've been doing here. Um, and yeah, trying to do that with uh, safe and uh, easy workflows. So there's a, there's a spoiler again on this slide. Um, we're going to dive way deeper into that in the next minutes. Uh, but that's basically what we came up with. Uh, I think the collaboration was a success. We kind of introduced a new class of container images that we called uh, chiseled, in that case, chiseled Ubuntu containers that uh, are basically half the size of the standard Ubuntu base images. And uh, it's sort of a new approach to building appliance type container images that is, I would say, bottom up instead of top down. But this is going to make more sense as we go through the, the presentation. Uh, another thing is that it's aligned with the Ubuntu LTS release cadence and support timeline. So you can really easily move from your development environments to your product environments without having to think too, too much about it. Uh, before diving deeper into the presentation, kind of an announcement recap if you missed uh, what happened between Microsoft and Canonical over the last few months and uh, weeks. Uh, .NET is now one common line away from Ubuntu users. So it's uh, app install.NET. Uh, .NET 6 if you're on 2204 and uh, above. 
and it's from that let six uh, that it's available that let seven is soon to be uh, available we have this goal to make always to always have available the latest .NET long-term supported release on the latest Ubuntu long-term supported release so that you always have this full trusted stack that has these vendor commitments behind it and you can uh, you can just use it without having to think twice. Um, ARM64 as well is uh, one of these things that will be upcoming in the next uh, weeks on Ubuntu uh, for, for .NET 7 and .NET 6 as well uh, for a seamless development to cloud to edge portable experience uh, again, it's one thing you develop on, on .NET 6, whether you're MD or ARM, and then you ship it, whether you're MD or ARM, and it's going to work uh, the same way. Um, and chiseled, we're going to dive deeper into that in this presentation, so no need to, to spoil it too much. Um, just a side note, we're going to use Jammy through the presentation. If you're familiar with Ubuntu or the broader Ubuntu community, you might already, uh, it might sound trivial to you. Uh, but otherwise, it's kind of a code name that we have. Every Ubuntu release that we do, we have an adjective and an animal. So Jammy Jellyfish was uh, the 2204. So whenever we say Jammy, we actually refer to the 2204 LTS. And everything that you're uh, going to see in this presentation works from 2204 and beyond, uh, and .NET 6 and uh, above as well. All right, so let's get uh, really started with uh, why you, you would care about distroless images and why you care about such uh, small container images. Um, and actually, the kind of first question that you could ask yourself is, what does it mean to have a distro on a container image at all? Um, and you kind of think that the, the shell and the package manager, if you, you had to kind of take down to something, uh, are really what gives a distro to feel and flexibility on container images to do anything, which is the issue, right? Because on a host or a VM, there's no issue with that. You just do whatever you want. But on containers, they are supposed to be immutable and really centered around your microservice that you're shipping. This is both for making it scalable, which was the, the first intention with containers, but also more secure, not introducing any, any unneeded dependencies. So yeah, having a distribution there might not be the best or might not make sense, uh, which is in the reason why in uh, 2017, a team at Google introduced this uh, distroless concept, removing really the distribution from uh, the containers in uh, effectively meaning if you think Ubuntu, removing Bash and uh, APT from the containers and anything else that you don't need. Uh, so yeah, there's an interesting fact here that the base image does contain a lot of packages that you don't need, like Curses and Tar, probably uh, not needed for most of the use cases. And uh, the outcome of these distroless images is an appliance type image that does one thing instead of doing anything, which is a good thing, uh, which is really a good thing if you want to have these scalable uh, container images that have less applicable that are really more focused on one process and uh, way more secure. Um, and every time we kind of say that to people that are not used to the distroless concept comes the question of what about updates then if you don't have any package manager anymore, if you're basically removed everything that made it a distribution, how do you manage the packages? Um, well, the answer should be straightforward because you should really not be using APT on a running container, whether it's to install or update something. It should only happen at build time. But this is still a fair question because if you're used to distroless, you cannot use it even at build time, uh, which is a flow, kind of a flow of, of distroless here. Uh, and that leads us to, to, the next, uh, to the next question, which is, is distroless a hype or an actual added value there? Um, and there's this good blog that we uh, have referenced on the side um, that gives this example of the OpenGDK image um, so there's like the official one that is like a full blown one, uh, quite big, and the distroless image that is uh, significantly smaller. And they both have zero detected vulnerabilities. So you might ask, why, why go through the pain of going through a distroless image that is harder to use or to build to have the same number of vulnerabilities? And I, I think the problem is not so much about size here as it is about provenance and maintenance of the images. And uh, in fact, the Ubuntu base image is a good example of that because it, it historically has been quite big in megabytes, but still well maintained and has very good track record of fixing quickly the CVEs and uh, vulnerabilities that you might have. But still, like, still, uh, provenance and maintenance is one thing, but you might want to decrease the attack surface that you're bringing into your images. And another downside of uh, distress images that probably was a huge disappointment actually, is that they are hard to use. Uh, it, it sounded like a great idea and probably game changing, uh, but if you, when it comes to, to building them or to adding packages or removing packages from them that you don't need, then it's a nightmare because you don't have the package manager anymore, whether it's at build or runtime, 
Uh, and so yeah, it's really hard to, to build and to maintain in the, in the future. So I've seen there are excellent reasons to consider using small images, in particular these distress type images. I, only thing that what we, we need to do at this point is remember why we're doing it and be sure to focus on what matters. Um, so the first thing I think when selecting new images or, or kind of building a new image is provenance. Uh, having a trusted vendor or a vendor you trust uh, that provides you with regular updates and predictable releases, it's really priority number one. And then, of course, you should make sure that you're using these uh, smaller images, and in particular, the distress type ones that come with this no package manager, no shell, only the, the bits that are required at runtime, uh, because they have advantages that are considerable. Uh, first one could be efficiency in size, uh, in bandwidth usage, in uh, performance, in speed time, like started time. Uh, the obvious one is the reduced attack surface. The less there is, the less there is to attack for, for someone with bad intentions. <laughs> and the last one uh, that is often ignored, but it's not nonetheless very important, is uh, updating. So if we came back to this example of the uh, OpenGDK image, if you're on the bigger one, it might have zero vulnerabilities, but whenever there is an update in the base image, you do have to rebuild your image and to update your own image and to re redeploy it and to restart it. Uh, so that's the way it is in content images, but if we can reduce that process and make sure we have as less updates as possible, that's uh, that's a good way. And uh, the, the OpenSSL package is a good example of that. It's one that is basically in any base image, and uh, it often has high or critical, not often, <laughs> when it has vulnerabilities, it, they are often high or critical. Uh, so you might want to avoid this liability if you are not using OpenSSL or any crypto stuff in your uh, application. But now that we know uh, that we might want to use these distress type images that have good provenance, what is really preventing us from actually using them? Um, well, as we saw, first of, thing, first of all, they are hard to use. Uh, so having convenient published toolings uh, that you can, you can trust um, is probably step one. Then there are not really any vendor that are behind these images or that are providing these images. So having a choice between free or paid support from a vendor that you trust could be uh, could be helping there. Same kind of same argument is um, having the possibility to choose between being on the latest version of everything and still having the option when you ship to production to to select an LTS one that is going to be long term supported and run your application for uh, some time. And finally, as we saw, the the possibility to customize them. So that's where uh, chiseling comes into play. And um, it's kind of the, the way to introduce chiseling is kind of saying, have your own slice of cake and eat it too. So you get to keep the distro, but also you remove the distro, kind of distro full, distro less images. Uh, the way we do that is, well, first we have to consider what is a Linux distribution like Ubuntu, but it's just, just a bunch of packages that are developed and tested together. In our case, Debian packages that have dependencies onto each other. And if we look into one of these package, it's again just a kind of set of files uh, that are compiled binaries, libraries, documentation, man pages, uh, and configuration that do your uh, working application tree. And so, if you were to handcraft a, a distress image, what you would do is you would select only the files and packages that you actually need to run your uh, processes, and you might even decide to break package dependencies. So here's what we did for for the the .NET ones. But that process that requires a lot of knowledge, and uh, this is done every time for every distress image at the image definition level. So what we did with Chasing is that we moved this work upstream by introducing the concept of package slices that are a predefined set of files and dependencies at a package level. And once you scale that up to the distribution, when well, you get the opportunity to grab a slice of your development environment, as we were saying in the beginning, in that case, a slice of the Ubuntu distribution to only ship in production exactly what you need, exactly the chisel slice of your development environment that is needed for your uh, processes to run. Uh, when I was building the slides, I remember this quote that uh, we had this quote moment within the team, uh, attributed to Michelangelo. It's kind of really seeing this uh, this big block of uh, rock that is Ubuntu, and well, the statue is already there, but you just have to chisel away the superfluous material. And I think that's actually what led us to use the chisel name. Uh, so that's pretty different in the backstory. And yep, concretely, what is uh, what this looks like for the chisel Ubuntu containers for .NET that's uh, on the screen. I think Rich is going to dive a bit deeper into it. Um, and you have the the kind of full blown one on the left that is still available for legacy usage and for development environments. And on the right side, the chiseled one when you when you're ready to move to production. 
Um, and very quickly, what's next for uh, Chisel is uh, well, growing the ecosystem of slices, doing that working with developers platform as we did with uh, the .NET team, and uh, having this Ubuntu Pro uh, experience kind of more integrated into the Ubuntu offering as a really first class citizen. So whenever you're using chiseled Ubuntu containers, you know that you have the same commitments as whenever you're using Ubuntu containers at all. All right, so now handing over to, to Rich. Uh, OK, yeah. Um, so let's see if I can figure this out. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'll tell you when I'm ready. Um, but, uh... Oops. Okay. Go ahead and minimize <laughs> that browser window, Rich. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm in the. I'm in the process. I'm. Uh, you got trying it. to pretend like I know how to use computers. <laughs> oh wow! Um, I realized I had quite that many PowerPoint windows open. Um. Oh geez. Um. Realizing. <laughs> Almost done. Okay. Yeah, so what I'm going to show you is a quick demo of what this looks like in practice, and then we'll 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 talk. Okay, now I'm ready to go. <laughs> Sorry about that. There you go. All good. Okay, so let's let's take a look at this. So we have this sample um, that I, I use all the time. It's in the .NET Docker repo. Oh, and can let you me, uh, can you zoom in a little bit so people can yeah, see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, what I was going to do, and I, I forgot to do. Um, you're going to be prevented from. Uh, presenting again. Okay, there we go. I intended to do that before. Perfect. So that's a bit better. Okay, so it's in this repo. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a couple things. So let's build. Let's, so we have all these Docker files in here. Uh, they all do slightly different things. So let's just build with the default one. Um, Speed.net app. And you'll quickly see I've done this already. And so now let's um, yeah, hide this. Now let's run this, um, oops, and uh, so, uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so that should work, cool. I'm, I'm not, I mean, I could show you the screen, but there's there's really no reason. So I'm, I'm hosting this in a container, that's awesome. Um, and so what I wanna show you is a couple things so we're going to docker exec into this image and um uh so we're going to run bash it's like oops i uh, forgot one key thing docker exec uh it okay so now we're in the image and so basically i can do anything now it's like oh okay um let's like remove this like pdb file like um you know um i can go into um yeah like i can say like oh where does this live you know i can party i can like delete that file i can replace it with something basically i can do anything at all in this image once i'm in there and that's all because i am the root user okay so let's try the same exercise again but with a chiseled image so uh basically the same thing but I have a slightly different Docker file. Already done that too. Um, chiseled. And one thing is we have to use a different port. I'll explain that in a sec. Now I'm going to do the same thing. So Docker PS. And I'm going to Docker exec. Docker exec. IT. That's the name. Run bash. We're gonna try and break in. It's like, oh gosh, um, that's not working. My hacker skills are failing me. What's going on is Bash is not in this image, right? It's like, okay, well, let's let's try something else. It's like, okay, well, can I even run LS in this image? No, like we've removed all these tools. And so I can't even get in there to show you which user it's running as. Like, oh, could I run who am I? Nope, not, not there. So the point is, is like, the, these these images now have these like super sharp edges 
because we've removed like all the convenience features, but the convenience features can also sometimes be the, uh, the problem ones from, uh, from a hacker standpoint. So these are very locked down. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the slides now. So I think uh, Valentine, if you can just, you can just run the slides. That's probably the easiest thing. All right, I'm gonna talk oh, to sorry. Do. Sorry, I did the screen of death thing. <laughs> Okay, let's look. Yeah, so you can go, you, you can, uh, you can do the slides. I think someone need to put them on screen, though. I'm just a, just a guest here. <laughs> they are in the backstage. Right. Okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you, I've got about eight minutes left um, about what we actually did. So I'll go through this quickly. So basically, you know, we wanted to, we took, wanted to take all this cool tech that uh, Valentine and team built, but, um, and we wanted to, um, yeah, so make our images smaller. But what we're doing is a little bit complicated. And so the promise here is that 95% plus of devs won't have to worry about any of this. Basically take the same images that you're using, slightly different tags, put your app on top and you're good to go. Next slide. And so this, this is uh, what this looks like. And so I'll go into a little bit more detail. So on the left, on, on the bottom for both, you have the kernel that's provided by the host. That's how all container images work. On the left, you have the OS, these popular packages that happen to also come in that image. Then you have the packages that .NET needs, then you have the root user, then you have the .NET layers, and then you have your app itself. And so on the right-hand side, basically the um, first three things, Ubuntu, base OS, po popular package, and packages for .NET all get merged together and a bunch of stuff removed. Like all those popular packages, they're gone. It's basically only packages for .NET plus their dependencies. And then we also use a non-root user, which folks have been asking us to do for years. Okay, next slide. Um, this, this is what it actually looks like. So um, this is our Docker file on Docker Hub. Um, you, you're free to look at it. You're free to use this. It all, it all works for everyone. And so what this is is saying, it is, we're basically passing data to the chisel tool, which says, here are the packages we need. That's, that's the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side of the underscore is here's the slice we need. And then the chisel tool does most of the rest for us. Um, in terms of what these images look like, so this is a kind of a layer view. So with the ASP.NET app, it, yeah, it just shows you what the sizes are. So let's go, let's go to the next slide where it's a slightly more complicated view. So we, we on the left-hand side, we have all these layers and you get to decide where you wanna come in at for .NET. If you want a self-contained app, then you're probably going to use this runtime depths layer. If you have a console app that you want to make framework dependent, then you use the runtime layer. If you have a web app that you want to make framework dependent, then you use the ASP.NET layer. And it shows the sizes for those. On the right-hand side, we've preserved all the layers. So you can continue using those layers, and they make sense to continue to deliver. Just see that they're fundamentally smaller. And I, I want to draw your attention to, like, our runtime depths layer, that's that's the layer, the Linux layer that only has our dependencies and no.NET. We've made that 13 megabytes. Um, and if you look at the top layer, it's like the ASP.NET layer, that's 100 megabytes. Well, um, that size with all.NET, so this has ASP.NET, .NET runtime in it at 100 megabytes, is actually smaller than the old runtime depths layer that had no.NET in it. So that's amazing. Uh, next slide. Um, I wanted to show with trimming, I, I've got um, .NET app here, it's 34 megabytes um, for the whole app, everything. I also did it with um, AOT um, and that was, uh, I can't remember, I think it was like 18 megabytes. Um, yeah, it was 18 megabytes. Um, so you can, you can get it down even smaller. Next slide. Uh, yeah, the comparison with Alpine is super apt. Um, so as you can see, it's basically in the same ballpark as the Alpine distribution. And so I think, you know, if you want the absolute smallest size and that's your primary metric you're going after, then I think Alpine continues to be a good choice. Um, we're friends with those folks as well. Um, and we think they do good work. 
if you want to kind of get the promise that Valentine was offering before, which is like, because very few people, I think, actually use Alpine as a dev box. They mostly use it for production. So if you want dev and production to match, then this Ubuntu-based offering is a great choice um, with basically no compromise because it's in the same ballpark as what you would have had with Alpine. Um, yeah, and maybe that maybe we'll make this the last slide. Um, although I have more, is you know how do you adopt this? Well, all you have to do is switch to this you know jammy chisel tag. Um, it's currently in our nightly repo um, because we actually haven't released this for production yet. It's kind of in uh, preview mode. We're hoping to make it um, productized by the end of this year or early next year. Um, but uh, but yeah, but we haven't done that yet. Um, well, so I don't know if we have any questions, but I, oh yes, so advanced scenarios, that's right. So there are some advanced scenarios. Um, I'm not really gonna go into great deal detail on those, but um, if, if you wanna learn more about this, you can either go to this repo, Ubuntu rock slash .net, you can go to the .NET, .NET Docker repo. Um, yeah, and there's some other yeah advanced scenarios that you can you can do. Um, yeah, okay. Well, maybe I'll quickly go through the rootless stuff. So rootless was a big part of the the journey for us. Like distroless and rootless, in theory, actually have nothing to do with one another, but we decided to marry those two concepts together because we thought they were a perfect pairing, and. Um, so the key thing here is this is how our Docker file changed. So we have to now use a port other than port 80 because port 80 is actually a root port. Uh, you have to have root permission to listen on that. Um, so we switched to port 8080. Um, that's something that customers are gonna, or you're gonna have to adapt to. Um, and then the other thing is we set this user called app and that's, that's basically our model. So we actually had to add a new user into our images called app. Um, yeah, and so non-root just gives you an extra layer of protection. Um, you, so in addition to removing the shell and the package manager, um, which require, uh, well, at least the package manager requires root permission to use, um, it just really locks down what you're capable of doing. Okay, I think we can, um, oh yes, we're also working on rootless without chiseled for our regular images for .NET 8. Um, that's where you can we you can learn about that. And we think that's a, an exciting offering in the the non-distroless case because we're we, we're a big believer in non-root. Okay, I think that's that's it. Yeah. I don't see any questions. Uh, there were comments obviously about having a smaller container, right? Because that would remove some of the vulnerabilities that might be because you have a component that you may not need. And the, the thing I like what you showed case there is that you can have a container that is specifically target for ASP.NET, right? That means you have a pipeline, like you have, a, you, have a, you can handle web requests, you can do all those things. And that is significantly smaller than a .NET app for like an agent that could be um, receiving messages from a queue or just processing or doing whatever right and there's yeah. a fundamental difference between those two yeah there, there was a there was a comment made about removing the package manager during during build and that being potentially a negative thing um we don't really remove i mean the package manager during build like particularly if you're using these dotnet images that are already built right all the chiseling is already done so you're just basically copying a layer on top of your built app and you're right. all good um if you're doing the chiseling yourself yeah you're you're building uh this kind of aggregate image of the operating system and .NET together um yeah you're kind of doing surgery um but right. that's that's what distroless is yep and then um, you get the advantage that chisel is kind of your package manager for from this unscratch image 100 percent right. yep <clears throat> Yeah, no, this is really, really great. Uh, thank you so much for um, taking the time to us to talk about it. I'm sure if you go to, if you look at the chat and if you look at Twitter, there might be some questions about it. There's always a lag, right? There's always people like, oh, I'm <laughs> looking at you know, two sessions ago or I'm looking at yesterday's session or whatever. So totally. it's not necessarily diff difficult to say, yeah, we have so-and-so right now. Uh, but um, Valentin, Rich, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and we appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for Thank having you. us over. Thank you.